Yo guys, what's going on? I'm Tim Kelly, joined by Justin Godsey of the Nation Sports Blog. This is the real sports talk, and the Nation Sports Blog presents the 30 Clubs, 30 Previews MLB Special. On to the Miami Marlins today, a team that had a horrendous season last year after moving in to a brand new stadium, bringing in a, bi a big name manager in Ozzie Guillen, and then going out and bringing in some star free agents such as Mark Burley and Jose Reyes. Things blew up for this team early on with Ozzie Guillen's comments about Fidel Castro. And then in the offseason, or they traded away Handler Ramirez at the trade deadline. And then in the offseason, after a 69-93 season, this team really just decided to blow it all up, Justin. Tr firing... Ozzy Guillen first. They bring in Mike Redman, their former catcher, who had been managing in the minor leagues for a few years. They bring him in as their new manager. But then they trade away in one big trade of the Toronto Blue Jays, one of the biggest trades in MLB history. They trade Mark Burley, Jose Reyes, Josh Johnson, Emilio Bonifacio, and John Buck. They trade all of them away to the Toronto Blue Jays. And then one of the pieces they pick up in that trade, Yunel Escobar, they then take him and they flip him over to, to uh, the Tampa Bay Rays, their cross-state rival. They trade him over there. So overall, they trade all those guys away. They move on from all of them. And in return, some of the guys they were able to sign were Chad Qualls, who had a horrendous season last year with the Yankees and the Phillies, John Roush, a veteran reliever, Juan Pierre coming over from the Phillies, Placido Polanco coming over from the Phillies. They signed Casey Kochman and Kevin Kuzman off to minor league deals. But uh, overall, Justin, what they did in the offseason was absolutely alienated their fan base and set themselves back for years to come. Really, Jeffrey Laurie, you're going to go out there and you're going to trade away top players in your organization who you signed the seat the off season prior. You're going to trade away Mark Burley, who you pay a lot of money for. You're going to trade. You're going to give away Josh Johnson, who's been your eight, who's been your ace for a while, and then you're going to trade away Emilio Bonifacio, who's played great defense for you, has been pretty productive, sort of in Miami for you. And then on top of that, you're going to trade away Jose Reyes. No, that is not cool. It's going to send this team to a downward spiral in 2013. There's just no depth on this team right now. Now, who they got in return was they got Hechevaria from the Toronto Blue Jays. You got Solano, who I, who I think came up through their minor league system. And then, the, just to cap it off, you got Placido Polanco, who's getting up there in age, and then who's going to be starting at third base, honestly. And then you have in the left fielder, starting left fielder, is Juan Pierre. I mean, seriously, this is not going to help you. But on the other note, you're going to go into your pitching, and you're not really going to have any depth to that. I honestly think that this was the most stupidest thing I have ever seen in baseball in quite a long time. Yeah, it really was, and it's the stupidest thing that I've seen since the other two fire sales at the Miami Marlins have had in history. And the stupidest thing I've ever seen in baseball is the fact that Bud Selig continues to allow Jeffrey Loria to have control of this team, to own this team, to keep this team in Miami when the fan base is just not a good enough fan base for the MLB. But now with the brand new stadium, they're there for the long haul. And, and quite honestly, Jeffrey Loria has run this team into the ground. He's in it just to singularly make a profit. He treats it as a business. And I understand there is part of that, that you, you don't want to necessarily lose all your money by owning an MLB team. But Jeffrey Loria, I read an article the other day about how he was sitting down with Jose Reyes like two or three days prior to the trade, and he told him, buy a new house in Miami. You're going to be here for a long time. And then within three days... Jose Reyes is shipped off not only to another team, but he's shipped off out of the country to the Toronto Blue Jays. I, I just I can't even think of any way that he could ever recover from this to make anyone e ever want to come back to Miami, ever want to sign in Miami. And not only did they give rid of all those players, but they pissed off John Carlos Stanton, who's young, valuable, and under team control. That reduces his trade value. He still has a high value, but it reduces it. And then they also piss pissed off Ricky Nolasco. And not that Nolasco is a great player, but he's one of the veterans on that team. And when he goes in with a negative attitude that rubs off on the rest of the team and the team around. That's just, that's not what you want to do. 
Let's get in, Justin, to the, uh, or to the lineup, pitching rotation, and bullpen. Break that down because, quite honestly, it, it's not pretty heading into 2013 for the Miami Marlins. The way that many people felt it was pretty heading into last year, it certainly is not right now. At catcher, you have a battle between Rob Brantley and Jeff Mathis. Jeff Mathis, one of the pieces they acquired in the trade with the Blue Jays. Rob Brantley, will start with him. In 31 games last year, hit 290 with three home runs and 30 or an eight RBI. So he showed that he has some pop. Other than that, I'm not 100% sure what he's going to bring to this team. He's very young and he's one of their top prospects. So I do expect that long term he is their starting catcher. I wouldn't be surprised if this year we see him and Jeff Mathis probably split time. I would rather go with Jeff Mathis out of the two. I think Rob Brantley will be deserving more as a backup role because his pop is good on, on good days. I mean, on bad days, it's not always there. He's more of an average type of guy. But for right now, the Miami Marlins have no choice but to start Rob Brantley during spring training because yesterday Jeff Mathis tore, I, I'm pretty sure it was his collarbone, and it, it's going to sideline him for six weeks. So, you know, it's giving the, or, the organization to look more into Rob Brantley. But... And with also with that trade to Toronto, they also give away John Buck, and now you're going to be going down to like the more younger guys, the guys who out throughout their MLB careers or mildly career for Rob Brantley in particular has not seen a lot of you know full time action. You know Jeff Mathis being with the Angels, you know he went over to Toronto last year, did not get a play a full season of baseball, being a backup throughout his career. I think with Jeff Mathis coming in, he provides more pop to his bat. Rob Brantley's more of an average type of hitter. I think you really need as much power in your lineup. As you can right now, so there's no power in this lineup whatsoever. Besides, yeah, besides Sean Carl Stan, and, and I, I think long yeah. term, there's no question Rob Brantley's the guy long term. But in this season, if Rob Brantley does not establish himself early on, and we look up after six weeks, the Marlins have a decision to make. They can say, we're going to stick with Brantley, we are going nowhere this season in all likelihood, let's stick with Brantley, or let's stick, or let's go, I should say, with Jeff Mathis once he's back healthy, because right now he gives us the better option. For me, I would go with uh, Rob Brantley, but we'll see what they ultimately do. At first base, Logan Morrison will be your starter at first base, someone who's been disgruntled with the fan, or with the uh, ownership and front office of this team numerous times after being sent down and, and really he, he's popular on Twitter and he seems like a nice guy and everything but his production just does not back it up I know that he hit 23 home runs two years ago but the 247 average wasn't good enough and then he got sent down to the minor leagues filed a grievance and then comes back last year and in 93 games he hits 230 if you're gonna get pissed off then come back the next season and improve on it and show everyone why they were wrong to send you down not take a regression the next season I agree I mean Logan Morrison I don't. I honestly, I'm not a huge fan of Logan Morrison. But looking at it on a reporter standpoint, Logan Morrison, if this guy's really going to be their everyday first baseman, then you gotta stop with, you know, being. You can be active on Twitter and everything, but you really gotta show it up on the field. You just can't be like, oh, I'm like Tim. You already pretty much said it good. You filed that grievance to get back up to the major league level because you're getting mad at the front office. If you're go you got to be a consistent hitter for this team. If this team is going to come out of nowhere, come way out of nowhere, and actually try to contend, because really Logan Morrison is just really needs to have full production all of the, the full entire season. Because as of right now, his average is not showing. It. You know, even though back in 2011 when he hit the 23 home runs, his average wasn't that really where it's supposed to be. Yeah, and the thing about Logan Morrison is. It's not even about producing to make this team a contender. It's about producing to hopefully, in his mind, get traded, go somewhere. He has the ability to play the outfield as well. So he could be of value to a team if he shows why a team should go out there and trade for him. So we'll see what happens with Logan Morris. And I think he's one of the key guys on this team this year. Backing him up, you have Joe Mahoney, who spent a few games with the Baltimore Orioles last year. But uh, spent most of the season in their minor leagues, hit 265, 10 home runs, and 56 RBIs at, at the AAA Norfolk Tide. So we'll see what he provides as a backup. At second base, Donovan Solano will be your starter. And uh, stick with us here, guys, because I understand that the Marlins are a team that does not have a lot of um, big-name guys. So it, it's... 
it's different trying to break this team down than some of the other teams we've done. But with Donovan Solano last year, 93 games for the Mons, hit 295, two home runs, 28 RBIs, stole seven bases. He actually played pretty well for this team, hit close to 300, finished the season with somewhat of a hitting streak. Justin, I think his biggest value is going to be just getting on base and actually uh, stealing bases when he's on base, hitting for a high average. He's pretty young. He's one of the pieces that I could actually see in Miami long term. Yeah, I agree with you. Donovan Solano, when you look at his minor league film, this guy has great speed on the path, but, you know, he's not one of those guys to go out there and steal a lot of bases for you. You know, last year was his highest in his career in stolen bases. I was during his major league time of 93 games, and he stole seven bases. I seriously think that this guy is going to be, you know, the Eric Ibar, the, it's going to be Eric Ibar right here because this guy really matches the same game plan what Eric Ibar has. You know, he doesn't hit a lot as much home runs as Ibar has, but you know what, the overall defense ability, you know, he can drive in some runs when he has the opportunity to when it, and if it's a good pitch or not. And then he has that great solid average that he has been holding ever since day one in 2005 when he started becoming a professional baseball player. You know, last year was the highest of, of his career batting 295 in the 93 games. I think this guy, is he MLB ready? Absolutely. I think he's really he's going to be a great uh, addition to this team. Yeah, and he's really going to get pretty much all the looks at second base unless they would decide to shake things up at third base and decide that maybe they believe Placido Polanco could potentially get some looks at second base, which I doubt at this point with his health and his bad back, but we'll see. Danny H. Havara, one of the pieces that they acquired from Toronto, he will be the starting shortstop, and you could also see him get some looks at second base if there were some injuries to Solano. In 41 games for the Blue Jays last year, hit two fifty four with two home runs. In the minor leagues, he had some success in terms of stealing bases, but he's kind of like a, a god that's going to steal a lot of bases, but he's going to get caught a lot as well. He, he's not necessarily the most efficient base stealer. He cleaned it up a little bit in 2012, stealing 8 of 10, but in 2011, he stole 20 of 35, which isn't a very good clip to steal at. He did hit 312 last year in the minor leagues, so the Marlins, again, are hoping that they get a guy who hits for a high average. He's very young, and with some of these guys with uh, Danny H. Havara being one of them, you, you really got to wonder, are they really ready to go out there this year and play 150 games? Not only are you saying that this season doesn't matter, but by rushing some of these guys like H. Havara out there every single day, I think it could end up hurting their careers in the long run. I absolutely agree with you, Tim. The only issue right now with I have with um, Hichavara, I don't, I, I'm not really good at, uh, pronouncing the names correctly, but Hichavara, when you overlook at his production down there in the minor league system, he was great. You know, he gets you home runs um, here and there. You know, he's a shortstop. He's not. He's a shortstop. The numbers are not high in numbers like, of home run totals, to be exact here. But this is a guy who can get you about five home runs a year on average. Because when you look down at his minor league totals, I mean, last in 2011, he hit eight home runs. And that was with, I think, either double A AA or triple A. And it was very and, and very um, great season for him. Now, he's going to be coming over and transversing, and transversing into a full-time shortstop at the major league level. I just honestly, I do not know how to pinpoint on how good is he going to be. And is he, is he going to have a hard time, you know, a full-time adapting to how MLB like has uh, we're a shortstop. Yeah, and again, he was a third baseman for a lot of time in the minor league, so we'll see if he has that ability. At third base, Placido Polanco is signed, and th this move to me pretty much sums it all up. In his prime, was Placido Polanco a solid, one of the best contact hitters, one of the hardest guys in the MLB to strike out? He always at least put the ball in play. Sure he was. Was he a guy who had the value of not only could he play second base, but he could play third base? Yes, he did. In 2013, does Palacido Polanco have any value coming off of two seasons where he was virtually useless for the Phillies? No, he does not, because the bottom line is that he has... The, the, one of the worst backs I've ever seen in the MLB. His health has declined rapidly over the last few years. He's 38 years old, I believe, 37, 38. It's just, as a backup, would this have been a respectable move? Yeah, maybe. At this point, as a starter, 
When you look at some of what the Nationals did in the offseason, how much better they're getting. The Phillies are going to get healthier this season. The Mets are doing some things. The Braves have made some moves to get better, getting both the Upton brothers. And then you just look at what the Miami Marlins did, bringing in Placido Polanco. I mean, seriously? I, it's, it's hard to really... What went on through the minds of Jeffrey Loria this offseason? And, you know, you can only do what you got to do, and I guess the best thing that they could do right now is bring in Placido Polanco over at third base. I was really thinking that you probably could go down to your farm system and possibly work out guys like Zach Cox, who they got from the Cardinals, Chris Coggle, or probably Greg Dobbs, who's their backup. So it's going to be a three-way race this spring training to find out who's going to be the backup to Placido Polanco. You know, his health has really declined, one of the bad backs in Major League Baseball, and you know what? I, I honestly, the best years of Placido Polanco has been gone for a while now, and I honestly kind of like him over at, sh uh, over at shortstop. I don't know how to pinpoint on how well Polanco would do this year. Yeah, and I, I honestly, I think by the end of the season, we're going to be looking at Greg Dobbs as starting third baseman because I don't think Placido Polanco will be able to hold up. Greg Dobbs. He's a tremendous, tremendous pinch hitter. He's a great piece to have off your bench. As a starter, he's probably below average. He can hit you in the 270s, 280s in, in a good year. I know he's had, he, he's been an inconsistent player throughout his MLB career, and that's why it's so hard to tell. He's had years where he's hit over 300, and then he's had years where he's hit under 200. And that that's kind of the life of a pinch hitter. And the years where he's really had a chance to start, he's going to hit you eight or nine home runs and get you about 50 RBIs, hit about 275. So he's going to give you very mediocre average production. The guy that I'm really looking at is Chris Coughlin because there's something to reach for with Chris Coughlin. Chris Coughlin was an absolute stud when he came up in his rookie year. He looked great in 128 games at 321, nine home runs, stole eight bases, was a solid fielder. He was playing outfield, I believe, then. He looked like someone who was going to be a long-term fit for this team. And since then, he's just never been able to find it, hitting 268 in 2010. He got back up to... Uh, or he went down, I should say, to 230 in 2011, and then in 2012, in 39 games, hit 140. This is really his last opportunity. You also have Kevin Kuzman off, so I, I, I don't know what direction the Marlins go in at third base, but the bottom line is, out of four guys, you can't even find one that looks like a good solution, really. Yeah, over at third base, there's a guy, like who I mentioned before, in Zach Cox, because when you're looking at it, I think Zach Cox, who played over and who played great college ball at the university, I think it was at Arkansas, he played great defensive baseball, played great, you know, overall ability as a third baseman was great. 23 home runs and 112 RBIs in his minor league totals. This is in two years, everybody. That's 10 plus home runs a year. And you know what? This guy will possibly be one of the most underrated third basemen in this Marlins. Not in Major League Baseball. I'm not going to go way into there. But I'm talking about in the Miami Marlins organization. Yeah, and it may, maybe that is another option. The bottom line is it, it's at the point where you just say, what the hell, why not with the Marlins at this point? Because there is not a great option at third base. Even if Placido Polanco has a good year, what, what are you going to gain out of it? Even if he has a good year, he's never going to be a guy that has any trade value. If he does, it's like a... A, a lifetime minor leaguer you're going to get in return in all likelihood anyway. So go with another one of the younger options. Maybe Zach Cox, maybe Chris Coughlin. Greg Dobbs really doesn't do much for you as a starter either. So they're screwed basically at third base is what we're getting at. In left field, Juan Pierre will be the starter. Pierre last year in his first season and only season with the Philadelphia Phillies hit 307, stole 37 bases. He's still a tremendous player on the base pass. The bottom line though is while he hit 307 he's going to get you he's going to get on base sometime does he have some value yeah but I, I really I watched the entire season of him hitting 307 and I really didn't walk away feeling like he had that great of a season he is a fourth outfielder at this point on a real team and that, that's what we're getting at is that in 2003, 4, and 5, was he a great piece that helped this team to win a World Series? Yeah, he was. What the hell is the point of bringing him back in 2013? Because the, the biggest value that Juan Pierre has is to MLB memes right now. <laughs> yeah, man, Ed, you pretty much brought that up pretty good, man. I mean, Juan Pierre, 
I honestly, I mean, he had a great season last year. Don't get me wrong, though. But with the with Philadelphia bringing, getting back all their stars, you got the the rising of Darren Ruff. There's just really no room on Juan, for Juan Pierre on the Phillies. So they had no choice but to let him go, let him walk. And as he tries to bring his talents to another team, so he's taking his talents to South Beach <laughs> and joining the Miami Marlins. Yeah, I mean, I'm not trying to bash Juan Pierre, but if you're a team that's trying to go through and rebuild and do something. I mean, you're blowing it up. We, we saw what they did this entire offseason. You're going to blow it up, then blow it up all the way. There's no use for bringing in a guy like Juan Pierre and having him take up the spot of what could be a young guy. Why not start Brian Peterson in the outfield? They're back up in 84 games last year. He did not have very good success, hit under 200. But he gave you 17 RBIs and stole eight bases. And at the AAA level last year, he hit 321. Why not give him a look? Because in 2011 at the AAA level, he hit 351. He has some potential. Two years ago at the MLB level at 265. Okay, he has some. Uh, he's a pretty respectable fielder. This is a guy that I look at as a, a potential starter for this team that would give you a better option ultimately than Juan Pierre because he brings some some youth, so, something to this team of value. Yeah, Chris Coughlin. Or not Brian, I mean Brian Peterson. You can also put Chris Coggin over there in left field. But Brian Peterson, you know, I'm not too really too familiar with the guy. But you know what? Once he's playing full baseball, I mean, I, ever, I see this guy sometimes when I'm watching minor league baseball. I, I do watch minor league baseball. For some of you guys who don't, do not know, I'm a huge prospect type of guy. And... You know, he's been with Florida for his whole career. I mean, I just remember him playing down with the New Orleans Zephyrs, who is, which is the team's AAA, in 2011. This guy has some great pop, batted 351 that year, and he's going to hit you home runs time to time. But what you're really and mainly going to be getting out of Brian Peterson is that solid average. Like I said, with the New Orleans Zephyrs, which is their AAA affiliate, batted 351. That is really impressive. And I think he can, is he MLB ready? Yes, he is. He's going to be taken on as a bench role, or he can be competing for a bench role because this outfield, there's a multiple options right now in this outfield. You got you know Chris Coughlin, you got Gorky Hernandez, and it just it just adds on from there. I mean, I really think that this Marlins team has been really concentrating more into their outfield and building up outfielders in their minor league system rather than with their pitch and rotation, which really needs the most help at this point. In center field, Justin Ruggiano is going to be the start. He's about 30 years old. Last year for the Marlins, Ruggiano in 91 games, he hit 313, gave him 13 bombs, 14 or 14 stolen bases, I should say. So Ruggiano was a pretty productive player for the Marlins last year. I like him out in center field. Uh, is he in their long-term plans? Probably not, but I could actually see him as someone that they could potentially trade at the deadline that has some value that maybe they could recoup a younger player. But uh, Justin Ruggiano does give them a pretty respectable option out in center. Yeah, but I honestly do not think he's going to have a repeat from what he did last year. Yes, he does play great defensive baseball. We saw that all last year. And plus, he got injured last year, so making those you know tremendous plays. And I honestly do not think he's really going to have a repeat from what he had last season. His average is probably going to be down a little bit. Could he be hitting a three? Could he prove me wrong? Absolutely. I'm not bringing him down or anything. But I don't see this guy going out there. And with his power, it's like coming out of nowhere. I mean, the past couple of years, he was with Tampa Bay in 2011. Then he spent, you know, 2011 and 2012, you know, split season 2012 in the minor league system. I honestly do not think he's going to have a repeat of 2012. Yeah, we'll, we'll see if he does. I, I would be surprised if he's able to hit 313 again. But we'll see. I'm not going to put it past him. I'm not going to put anything past the Miami Marlins at this point. Gorky Hernandez, who they acquired from the Pittsburgh Pilots at Pirates, I believe, on a waiver deal last year. He will be their backup center fielder in uh, 25 games with the Pirates. He hit 083 after coming over to the Marlins. He hit 212. So total last year, hit 192 with three home runs, stole seven bases. Cases. I mean, Gorky Hernandez never really even showed a ton in the minor leagues. He was a 260 hitter, 250, 260 hitter. Um, Justin Ruggiano is your guy in center field because Gorky Hernandez might have a nice glove, but he's really not going to provide anything in the way of hitting. Yeah, 
Borges Fernandez, another guy who I've been watching a, a film on and everything. I'm a huge film guy, watching prospects. It's my type of thing. Borges Fernandez, throughout his career, which started in 2006, really did not show. You know, he, he I'm surprised that he even made it to the major league level, to be honest with you guys. Got his first major league taste last year when he was acquired from the Pittsburgh Pirates, or from the from the Pittsburgh Pirates to the Miami Marlins last year. He played in 45 games, and he also played as the backup role to McCutcheon and Tabata and so on and so forth. But he's coming over to Miami, and he's going to be also going to be the backup role to Ruggiano. So I, I think that's the best that they can do at this right, at right now. In right field, I know we've been highly critical of this team. But that's really the only way to go about it. That's what Jeffrey Loria and this organization deserve at this point. The, the one positive that they have left, that is John Carlos Stanton, who is still only 23 years old, has the best power of probably any player in the MLB at this point. Last year, hit a career high 290, a career high 37 home runs, and just fell short of his career high in RBIs with 86 RBIs. Stole six bases, is a tremendous fielder in right field. The sky's the limit for Giancarlo Stanton, and quite honestly, if I'm them, I would hold on to him for a couple more years and see where you are, reevaluate. Because if you look at a, a comparable situation with Felix Hernandez and the Seattle Mariners, a few years ago, people were saying they should just trade Felix Hernandez. He's going to end up with the Yankees at some point. Just move on from him. But then we. Waited a few more years. Felix Hernandez got better and better. He kept people coming out to Seattle at least the once or in, in some weeks twice that he was pitching. And as he's progressed, the team has gotten better, shown improvement, and ultimately it was enough to keep him there and want him to stay there. And he signed a long-term deal this offseason, and they have the face of their franchise. If they had decided to trade Felix Hernandez, they still would have gotten pretty much the same value. So from John Carlos Stanton's perspective, I think that the case is the same. Enjoy what he gives you the next few seasons, next two or so seasons, and then reevaluate and maybe look at trading him. But I, I don't really see a point of trading John Carlos Stanton now because he's the only player in your team worth watching. There was rumors also speculating that you know the next guy out was probably going to end up being either Stanton or Ricky Nolasco. But you know what? If you were to trade them, this team, what we have predicted as of right now, was could, could it have even been worse because... If they were to get rid of either or, or either or, I think this team really is going to be dug right in so deep into the ground. You know, it's not even funny. But holding, being able to hold on to these guys is gonna, you know, it's gonna help guys right now a little bit. But you, you have Jean Carlos Stanton, the face of the franchise, right here, guy who last year exploded onto the scene, on for the Miami Marlins and hit 37 home runs. The first of his career. It's the first time in his career that he's getting over 30 home runs. And he had a 290 average on top of that. I still think that this guy, this guy is going to be a freaking, I don't know, champ. he's going to be a world champion with another team. I honestly do not see him staying at Miami Marlins or a Florida Marlins if they decide to change their name again. <laughs> this guy's not going to stay long-term with the Marlins. I can just... Freaking clear right now. This is not. He's not going to stay long term. He's mad at the front office. Is he mad still a little bit? We do not know. Maybe a little bit. Ricky Nolasco's not happy. I mean, the, they really got to start bringing in new guys, some more productive guys. I mean, what they have right now, and if they're just depending on John Carlos Stanton, you know, that's going to suck because it's a team sport. You just can't rely on one guy. And if, if this is the they're out there going, then John Carlos Stanton is their guy. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know what to say because I've watched the NL East as a Phillies fan my entire life, and I, I've just I've always looked at the Marlins the, the same way. Even when they made this one-time thing last year, it never really wowed me because I didn't think that they were gonna be a contender. They weren't, and then they they ultimately move on from it after one season anyway. So I I don't know what to say about the Marlins. The bottom line is that they've screwed themselves because not only again, not only did they piss off the players that they traded and anyone that could have potentially come there, but they pissed off people like John Carlos Stanton and like their ace Ricky Nolasco who I mean, he's not an ace material anyway, but they pissed him off, and he's one of the veterans on this team. Ricky Nolasco has had an ERA over 440 for the last four seasons with this team. Quite honestly, I, I think that trading him is in their best interest because they can get something for him. Teams look at Nolasco as maybe an option as their fourth or fifth starter, and he is overpaid, so... The Marlins are always happy to trade away players who make any money, and I would think that Ricky Nolasco is a guy that we'll see traded at some point this season.
I can see, yeah, I have to agree with you there. I think this team uh, depends on how bad and like, how deep in the ground they are in the early parts of the season. I think Ricky Nolasco, who's been on a lot of teams' trade radar for quite a while now, is going to end up getting traded at the trade deadline. I think they can get a hefty either uh, one or two, maybe even three prospects coming back into Miami so that they can go down in the minor leagues, have player development, develop the good players, and bring them up to the MLB sometime in the near future. I think for right now, if, if, is he an ace right now for, for an, an actual contending squad? No. Is he going to be a number two? No. Is he going to be a number three or a number four? Absolutely. I have to agree with you there, Tim. And Nick, Ricky Nolasco... You honestly, you got, you got to get as best the best you can out of Ricky Nolasco because he's the ace of your squad. And when you're going down, it, I mean, it's just the the depth of this in this pitching rotation is not the greatest. No, well, that that's an understatement, really, because Jacob Turner at the number two spot. Jacob Turner is a young pitcher, extremely young. He's only 21 years old. So we'll we'll see what Jacob Turner gives them at this number two spot. Uh, coming over from Detroit last season, midseason after a trade, he was one and four, but gave them a 3.38 ERA in seven games. He is someone that is in their long-term future, and Jacob Turner is someone that they should be happy to have in their long-term future because did he struggle with the Tigers and very limited experience? Yes, but what we saw to him in seven games with the Miami Marlins last year looks well, very impressive. I, I like Jacob Turner, don't get me wrong, but you know what, This like I'm going back to Ricky Nolasco, they, they, they just need to bring in another guy in free agency, you know Kyle Loesch is still out there, try to force him to come in, I know this team has money, cleared up so much cap space, go out and spend it, you gotta go out and bring in another pitcher, Jacob Turner is great to have in their long term future. I, I have to agree somewhat there with you, Tim, that Jacob Turner is going to be in the long-term future. But you know what? Is he going to be there for quite a while? Is he, are we talking, you know, eight years down the line? I do not think so. I think they're going to end up putting him in a, in a package deal somewhere down the line. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't disagree with that because that's what they do, have done with pretty much every other player that's come through there. Henderson Alvarez will be their number three starter, another piece coming over from Toronto last year, 9-14 and 14, with a 485 ERA. Two years ago in 10 games for Toronto, he had a 353 ERA. That was a lot more impressive, I think. He will be their number three guy. Nathan Eovaldi is going to be their number four guy. Last year, Eovaldi spent some time in the MLB with both, with the, both the Los Angeles Dodgers and the Miami Marlins. Going a combined four and thirteen with the four thirty ERA. The four and thirteen part looks bad. The four thirty ERA on this team for the number four starter. It's certainly it's not Cy Young material, but it's not horrendous. And then at the number five spot, Wade LeBlanc will be your number five starter for the Miami Marlins. Went two and five last year with a three sixty seven ERA. Gave you a, a four sixty three and a four twenty five ERA the previous two seasons with. The San Diego Padres. So Wade LeBlanc will round out this rotation, Justin. I really will start off with Henderson Alvarez. You got ahead of me here, but Henderson Alvarez is one of my favorite guys. When you looked at the Toronto Blue Jays, I was I I really enjoy watching the Blue Jays, but mainly when Henderson Alvarez is on the mound, I really tune in because this is a guy who really has some great stuff. This guy did not go to Double A. This guy did not go to Triple A until his until he got with the Toronto Blue Jays full time in two thousand and well in two thousand eleven. This guy made a huge jump and he got some playing time up there in two thousand eleven. He went one and three with a three fifty three ERA in ten games and then. And he went back down to the minors. He got up to, to, to Double A during the 2011 season. He was with Dunedin, which is their uh, Single A Advanced League, in 2011. Spent half a season there, and then he went up to the next level with New Hampshire. I think that's how I think it is New Hampshire, which is their Double A affiliate. Then he got his way back up to the Major League in 2011 full time. He went nine and 14. This guy is going to be an up and coming guy for the Miami Marlins. I have a good fit for him, and I really like that player coming over to the Miami Marlins. Going to Nathan Eovaldi, it's, he's still young, he's still going, he, he still got to get the hang of it, you know, he's still young, he's only, this was his second time in Major League Baseball playing, you know, back when he was with the Dodgers in 2011, it wasn't as good as it was either. I still think this guy still has a lot of 
he still has a lot in him to be a good pitcher. Not a great pitcher, but a good pitcher, a good decent pitcher in the rotation. I still think give him some more time. Let him adjust to full-time in the MLB. And you know what? This is a good year to start that. Um, going over to Wade LeBlanc, you know, I've seen him play with the San Diego Padres for a, a couple of years. You know, last year with the Marlins did not really shine a whole lot with a 2-5 and five record, 367 ERA. You know, well, rounding up the rotation, I still think that Wade LeBlanc is still contending for a rotation. As you got, I think it's Brad Brad Hand and uh, Tommy uh, Tom Kohler. These guys are going to be really contending. And then at the number eight held, Alex Santabaya or Santabia, uh, w- uh, the, the, another up and coming prospect in the team's organization who has been here since 2006. I mean, this guy has not been getting a lot of looks. This guy's been phenomenal throughout their minor league system. Give him an opportunity and try to get him in some point throughout the season because this guy has a great arsenal of pitching, and that's what this team really needs. But you cannot go wrong with having a three-way you know, battle for number five, um, Bradham, Kohler, Sanabia, and also Wade LeBlanc, or a four-man race, you should say. Their bullpen, then the three guys we're going to look at are Mike Dunn, Ryan Webb, and Steve Shisak. Mike Dunn last year went 0-3 with a 491 year. That was extremely disappointing. Prior to that, though, he had a very, very good year in 2010 with a 189 ERA for the Braves, and then in 2011 had a 343 ERA. If they can get somewhere in between those two years, that's going to be big for them. And then Ryan Webb will be their other setup man. Again, a guy that struggled last year with a 403 ERA two years ago, That though, at a 320 ERA. If they can get that, then that's going to be the best for them. And then Steve Shisak will be their closer, uh, throws sidearm, a really exaggerated sidearm. Um, go went five and two last year with a two sixty nine ERA, saved fifteen and nineteen, which isn't great. We'll see if he can actually improve on that this year because fifteen out of nineteen, four blown saves for a closer in one year isn't bad, but nineteen isn't a full year for a closer either. So you have John John Rauch who will also set up. Uh, he, he's going to be another option out of that bullpen. So they actually do have some pretty decent options out of the bullpen, but a lot of these guys are counting on bounce back years. I, I, absolutely, because this team is going to be going from Heath Bell to their, from their closer to Steve Sishek, who was actually the setup man for Heath Bell last year. But when you look at who they brought in, I'm a huge fan of John Roush. You know, he has a he had a decent time with the Mets. Coming over to the Marlins, he's going to have a bigger opportunity to revive, you know, a couple of down years with the Mets. But he's, he's coming over to Marlins where he's going to get more playing time. Now, for Chad Qualls, I don't know the whole point of why they brought him over. I honestly do not see him going to be on the official opening day roster. This guy just had so many, you know, flaws last year with the Pirates, with the Phillies, with the Yankees. I mean, it's better for him to go down and start a triple. And then if he's good enough, give him the opportunity to come back up to the major league level, more than likely as a late inning reliever as he was throughout his MLB career. But going to Steve Shitsack, this is a guy who has been shining on me for a while now. Last year, he was just lights out for the for a long, for a while. I'm waiting for a, a prospect who's been on their team for a while, just wanting to come out and shine. And this guy really shined on me. A 5-2, and two, 269 ERA. This guy really needs to have a repeat. If they're, if they're able to get into you know a, a, a situation where he's a close, you cannot go wrong with bringing in Steve Shisek. Alright, so Justin, we've spent about 45 minutes pretty much blasting the Marlins, so let's get straight into it. What is your record prediction for the Miami Marlins this season? It's not going to be good. I, we're, we're trying to not take offense to any of the Marlins fans. I know for you, the real Marlins fans out there, I'm hoping that they can actually, you know, really do something, but I honestly do not see them really competing. I have them in last place, man. I mean, there is not a lot of depth to this team. There's a lot of holes. Well, they're not a lot of holes. There's a lot of questions mainly on this team. You know, is John, is John Carlos Stanton, he's going to be carrying the workload. You really need full production out of Logan Morrison this year. you got to look at the ability. you got to look at the health also of Placido Polanco. Juan Pierre, if he can have the season I had last year, that's good for him. Justin Ruggiano, that's a guy who I do not think is going to have a 2012 season. Solano, Donovan Solano, you know, he's good. Um, Hechevar, I honestly do not know how he's going to play playing full-time at the major league level. You know, the catcher's position is up there in question. The pitch rotation, the depth is not not the, at the greatest where I thought it should have been. You know, there's just so many holes. And I honestly, this team does not have the uh, right amount of tools to compete against the Washington Nationals, against the Atlanta Braves, against the Philadelphia Phillies, and even against the New York Mets. No, they don't. And um, I, I, I had the Astros last year with like one of the worst records in MLB history, and they ended up reaching, I think, 60 games about. So 
I'm gonna. I don't think this team is much worse if they're worse at all than the Astros team last year. So I'm gonna say 60 games tops, and that's where I'll leave it at. That is Miami Mons 2013 season preview. For those of you who have watched this far into the video, I appreciate it. Thank you for tuning in. We will be previewing the Seattle Mariners next. Thank you for tuning in. I'm Tim Kelly for Justin Godsey. We'll see you guys next time.